it speaks about the reason why the Gemach, Gemach is an acronym for Gemils Chasodim, this free loan or to give loans to a person, why it's so neglected and undervalued. Not only that, people feel they're the come upon. When somebody asks them for a loan, it's almost like a breach of their, their privacy. See, so he says something interesting. A person who's given the privilege to serve the master, and only certain people are qualified to serve the master. You should wait for the moment when you can serve that master in that special way. Who are the officiants of, of Hashem? The angels. So God says, not only are the angels my officiants, but the ultimate officiant are my children, the Jewish people. So here we have the privilege to do a mitzvah, which is lending a fellow Jew money, which is a mitzvah, positive commandment. And yet, somehow, we don't appreciate its value. Comes to a lulav, tefillin, the same Jew who values that and feels privileged when he wears the tefillin, takes the four species, will go to all lengths to buy it and make sure it's perfect. And he prides himself. When it comes to the mitzvah of lending a fellow Jew money, he flees from it. He doesn't value it. So he's trying to explain why. Why, if it is a mitzvah, positive for him, no less than tefillin and, and lulav and sukkah and matzah, why is this mitzvah somehow neglected? And the first thing he says, most Jews don't understand that lending money to a fellow Jew is more than It's more than living, loving your fellow as you love yourself. It's not yet be nice to you, to your brother. It's literally an obligation. Kesef Talvis Ami, which is the positive commandment the way it's expressed in Torah, you must lend money to my people, to my children. One another have to lend. If a person's in need and you have the ability to lend and nobody's telling you to put yourself in a compromised position where you may not be paid back, then you have an obligation to lend that person. So if that's the case, so what would the solution be? Study the mitzvah. You should study. Ask someone to direct you to the text, to the source, and study it. But times studying something is not sufficient. Why? Because people, if Jewish identity is conditioned, identifies with Tefillin, Jews with Tefillin, if most, God forbid, Orthodox Jews didn't wear tefillin, tefillin would be a struggle to put on tefillin. But since if you are that Orthodox Jew, from the moment you're bar mitzvah, you wear tefillin, it's not such a challenge to wear tefillin. It's not such a challenge to buy the four species or to take them. Because it's something all Jews do or all Orthodox Jews do. But lending money, even Orthodox Jews, people are committed to what they should be committed, what this area is somehow a weak link. He says, why? Because people don't realize it's an obligation no less than the others. So we're not in the loop, so to say. We're not conditioned to understand that it's something we must do. That's firstly. It's a famous word from Rabbi Shol Salanter. Shol Salanter says, you know, the, the Gemara tells us in a number of locations I've created the evil inclination. The only antidote for the evil inclination is to study of Torah. So Soslanta says, if you feel that you're somehow getting weak in certain areas of obligation, you should study that area. For instance, a person feels he's somehow has a less appreciation for tzitzis. You study the laws of tzitzis. There's something innate in studying the laws which will give you that appreciation to be overcome all the hurdles to be able to internalize its value. That's what he says. Any mitzvah you feel that you're waning, you should study it. And by studying it, that will give you that spiritualization, that spiritual infusion, which will give you the capacity to appreciate its value. That's the very soul salanter. So I'm saying what the Chofetz Chaim is advising you he says, if a person doesn't fully grasp and understand it's an obligation whatsoever, definitely you should study. You should study from the source. 
from the text to the to the actually to the oral law and to the Shulchan Aruch, the code of law is exactly how to what degree you're obligated to lend. And the Chavetz Chaim, part of this work that he has here, he has one section. He speaks about the obligation of lending money, how, when, where, priority wise. He actually he details every aspect of it. But he says sometimes it's not enough. It's like the Mesilsa Sharm says, the Ramchal writes, sometimes you have to read certain stories, like from the Talmud, about the importance and what the payback is, so to say, and what the value of the mitzvah is. You know, Mishle Proverbs was written by Shlomo Melech. What's Proverbs? It's allegories. It's Proverbs. It's given the equivalent. Torah is sweeter than honey. The only we as human beings, we relate best if we put it into a physical context. What is the equivalent of? King David says, Tovali Torah Spicham Alfi Zova Chesed. The words of Torah of your mouth have greater value than thousands of talents of gold and silver. If you know what gold and silver is, thousands, you understand what its value is. Because we can relate to it. So to quantify it, give us a semblance of understanding by equating it to something of something was precious in the material realm, that gives us an inkling of what the value is in the spiritual realm. And it's even more than that. Totally, it's even better. It's greater than that. Shlomel compares it to diamonds. The Torah itself has greater value than, than precious gems. All this. And continuously. Torah Shlomel says, I've given you a, a phenomenal commodity. Don't abandon it. And God has encouraged you Again, we're physical beings. We don't have the capacity to fully, as they say, to put our heads around it. We don't have it. And a base, the basis for it, the foundation is what we call emuna, is really belief, believe in God. God says, this is what it's all about. You take God's word for it, then you have no problem carrying through. But the more you acclimate yourself, the more you condition yourself to be involved, the more you have an appreciation for what its innate value is. You know, it's interesting. People, when it comes to study Torah, to get over the hump, there's a certain inertia. We have difficulty very often. But when you finally somehow push yourself, you, you study it, so the person you studied with says, did you really enjoy it? He says, yes. So once you engage in it, very often you, you really enjoy it and you're happy you did it. You don't regret you did it. But very often to get yourself to the point where you are going to engage, that's that's the challenge. There's always there's like an inertia holding you back. But once you're in it, then afterwards you have an appreciation. Person has difficult getting up in the morning to go to shul with Davin. Davin at home, Davin with a minion, especially if it's a minion, Davin's with slowly... And they daven out loud. They they they, they say the words with 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 kavana. They're focused. It's inspiring. It's a it's it's literally an experience. It's not you going through motions. It's an experience. And the person normally doesn't go. Then he does go. He feels exhilarated. He feels touched because you've, you're experiencing it. And he doesn't regret. But yet, most times, he doesn't get up to come go, or he feels he has other priorities. But when he goes, he feels, you know, maybe I should assume this as part of my routine. Again, that Yates are at an evil inclination. He keeps whispering in our ears. He said, you know, once a week is enough. You've had the experience. You don't need more than that. And we're always convinced. We're always distracted. You know, if you read about people who get Alzheimer's, people when they're older, they're they're about to say something, and in the middle of a sentence, they just drop off, and they can't continue because they forgot what they had said a moment ago. So they can't continue with the thought. Unfortunately, it's a malfunction in the brain. It's interesting. The Eight Sahara has the ability that literally, could you imagine you're flying over the Atlantic, and all of a sudden you realize you don't have enough fuel to get you across. What happens? You drop, just drop out of the sky. A person's all revved up to do something, and all of a sudden, he puts a damper on it. And you don't even realize the enthusiasm you had until this moment to go beyond that moment. And then you're on to something else. You get distracted. 
and this is a ploy of the Yitzhar continuously. You're learning, and all of a sudden something comes to mind. And you discuss it. The moment you discuss it, you're out of the loop. You're not distracted. You're fully in it. And that's continuous. And it's a challenge. And it's it's the conditioning process. Not to allow yourself to be distracted. Because the moment you let the, that breach come into your thought process, into your spirit, into your energy level, it actually, all of a sudden, it fizzles out. That's what happens. So the Chavitz Chaim says, first and foremost, one has to understand that there's an obligation. You know, we can discuss, you know, we spoke about the obligation of stalker, giving charity. If one gives charity to a person who's in need, it's a positive commandment. If one withholds, it's a negative commandment. You're not permitted to withhold Helping a person who's in need. Talking about a Jew, not a non-Jew. Non-Jew, you have no, there's no, well, that's, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not a positive or negative commandment if one does not, okay? But you understand, why is it such a challenge to take a dollar out of your pocket or take a quarter and put it in the snucker box is not a challenge. But to give something which is semi-substantial, it's a little bit of a challenge. Why? Because whatever you have, you see as yours, it's your money. And when you have your money, a certain amount of income, you allocate it. You allocate some for savings. You allocate something for expenditures. You allocate some for leisure time, for vacation. The moment you give that charity, and you saw that charity is part of the, your, your, the funds available to you, that means you're dipping into the till and you can have less for all those various things that you need. That, that is the problem why it's a challenge. But let's say initially, and this, this is the beauty of having all these funds, you know, communal funds, you put a certain amount of money in there, you take 10% of your profits, you put it in there immediately. The moment you put it in there, there's no challenge any longer. The challenge maybe is to put it in there, but once it's in there, it's not a challenge any longer. So now if somebody approaches you or a need comes up, you're not taking money out of your pocket any longer. You're only directing something that you designated if it's Stoko, to it should go to the appropriate location. But there, what are you doing? You're actually, you beat the evil inclination at his game to a degree. Because all the reasons why not, subconsciously, many of those reasons have actually been actually waysided. You've gone around it. They, don't, they have no application to you. It's, it's a phenomenal thing. And you can give stock easily, relatively speaking. If your person wants to, it's not an issue. It's not an issue you have to discuss it with your wife. You don't have to discuss it with your veterinarian because you didn't pay the bill because that money is not available for the veterinarian bill. You got it. Speaking to certain people on the Zoom here. Okay? So today, if you do the, you approach it correctly, you have less of a problem. You're warding off issues. But first and foremost, you have to understand, it's not just doing a good deed. You're doing a humanitarian act. You have an obligation. You know, this negative commandment that God forbid if a Jew's life is in jeopardy, or maybe in jeopardy, and you're able to do something to take him out of harm's way, it's a Torah obligation. And if you don't, it's referred to, you should not stand by while your brother's blood is shed. And the conventional case is a person's drowning, a Jew, and you're able to jump in and save his life, and you don't. You're the cause of that person's death. Person has held accountable. What about if you can't swim, but you could call some soon enough that help could come and save that person's life, and you don't call? You're a violation. You stood by while your brother's life, blood was being shed. What about charity-wise? A family is literally below the poverty level. And because of this, and if they can't put food on the table, the kids go astray. They get abandoned religion. They go who knows where. And you could have intervened. Even if you can't give yourself, 
You could have alerted people who could help that family, and you did not. It's not my issue. It's their issue. You're held accountable for not intervening there or not, not alerting others who could help that family. You know, many years ago in Israel, Jews being missionized was a very big problem. Missionaries, and it's not against the law in Israel, or maybe it's on the books, but the government did not any way get involved to stop miss missionary activity in Israel. Years ago, there many stories how they took Jews and took them to the Jordan, and they immersed them, they had them baptized, all kinds of stories to accept Christianity. And there was an organization called Pelim. Pelim. They went and they would go and they would speak to the families. Why? Because many, there were certain times, let's say the Moroccans, when they had many uh, immigrations to Israel, these people came with nothing. Very poor people. And the missionaries, they would come and they'd say, you know something? We'd like to help you. We'll give you a certain amount of money per week, per month, and you can put food on the table, and you could we could buy clothing for your children, and we'll even find you a residence, we'll pay your energy bill, and they would have all kinds of incentives. And as a result of that, there was a certain trust established between this person. They didn't realize these people were totally oblivious, they didn't know what this was all about. When they were in Morocco, there were no missionaries. When they were in Tunisia, wherever, Yemen, there were no missionaries. All of a sudden now, they're being hoodwinked. And all of a sudden they say, you know, why don't you come? You know, we'll you, know you have so many children. Let, let us take you. We have a, a play group. We'll take your children. We have a kindergarten. Why don't you come to our kindergarten? And gradually, they exposed them to many things with it, which they shouldn't have, which was Christianity. That's what they did. So they had this organization called Pilim that they went and they would go to these same families to try, firstly, to provide for them what, what the missionaries were providing. And even if they, they were somehow influenced to a degree, to wean them from, from that, to take them away from that, that those influences should not have any, any effect on them. And there were major battles because the, sometimes the children were taken into, into mo monasteries to be taught and they would knock on the door and say, but do you have any ch Jewish children here? Because it's, it was against the law. But the government didn't do anything to intervene. And they say, no, we don't. And then you have, and they were all young men, these people, people that in their 20s, and they get a ladder, they climb over the wall, they go in, and they see Jewish children being taught Christianity and do physical fights that they had to call the police. What are you talking about? The way it's said in Shulchan Aruch, God forbid, if a person's child is, is taken, kidnapped, and his physical life is not in jeopardy, but his soul is in jeopardy, you're permitted to violate Shabbos. It's Pekoch Nefesh. Because Torah says, live by my Torah, you don't have to die. Physical death, spiritual death. This is a spiritual death. But again, that's Losam Adam Re'echo. You should not stand by while your brother's blood is being shed. If you're able to help a person financially, or even to advise him where to go, that he should not have a financial collapse a bankruptcy, or his home being taken from him, which is a, tre a tremendous trauma for that family, to be dispossessed, be homeless. Could you imagine God to be going into a homeless shelter because a person's ha home is taken from him? The cases where families were put on the street, they had nowhere to go. And they, unfortunately, there are many stories. These people are under the radar, and you have the ability well, it's not your issue. The Israeli government should take care of it. You know, it's easy to, to shirk yourself from responsibilities, but if it is your responsibility and you don't, there's an issue. There's a claim against you. So the Chofetz Chaim says, first you have to learn to know what the laws are. If you know the laws, now at least you know the law, now we talk about challenges. Are you going to do it? Or are you not going to do it? But if you believe you're just a good Samaritan, you're doing a nice thing, a nice thing versus something which... It's like pushing a boulder up a mountain. Usually, you don't push the boulder up the mountain. But if you understand it's an obligation, so then you give it your best, and the more you appreciate that, then you're better off, you're in a better place than you were before. This is the Chofetz Chaim. But very often, even though the, con 
the context is usually negative. You know, there's a thing called a pack mentality. When people do something in a group, it's a pack. You know, just as it's it's understood in the negative, it's in the positive too. If people as individuals want to do something, they're at one level. But if everybody's doing it, you get caught up in the feeling and each one actually inspires the other. So very often, if you present a certain project to a group of people, and all the people buy into it. And everybody feels it's a great idea. It's important. We have to do it. And each person commits himself. Doing it jointly. As we say. The sum total is greater than its parts. Of course what that does to everybody. It galvanizes them. And motivates them. They're able to accomplish things. That individually. Even if you have the means you can't accomplish. It's only because jointly everybody's doing it. As a result of that. You're able to achieve what you want to achieve whether it's input, whether it's financial, whether it's connection-wise, whatever it is, does make a difference. Yesterday, I was speaking to somebody about the Chofetz Chaim, said a, a beautiful word regarding something. So I said something to you. Read enough about the Chofetz Chaim, his writings, his Torah, and him as a person. You know, people have questions. Theological questions about God, about events, why, what, when. But if you have a clear lens, you don't have a question. Why don't you have a question? It's not only because of belief. You see clearly what's going on. You know, a doctor sees a person has fever. He sees the person's condition and the person who has fever. You know, fever, I'll take aspirin, I'll take Tylenol. You know, it'll help you, but you have to. we have to address why, why do you have fever. It's the same thing. The Chavetz Chaim understood. So very often he would ask a contradiction, two statements of King Solomon. And it seems to be they're not reconcilable. And all of a sudden he gives a simple answer. He said, it's ingenious. And it is ingenious. But it's not because of his genius. It's because of his level of belief and faith and everything else. It's a simple answer. But if you don't have that level of faith and belief, they're not reconcilable. It's the same idea. Things are difficult because we don't understand the level of responsibility we have. But if you reckon, recognize to what degree we're bound and what the value of it is to us personally is beyond anything you could imagine and you study it and you have examples, then you're motivated. Same idea. And that's exactly what he's saying over here. So I'd said last time, we, we, the footnote says something interesting here. You know, there's a story, there's a book, it was put out by Feldheim maybe 35 years ago, maybe 40 years ago. It's called The Silver Era. About Rabbi Eliezer Silver. He's a Lithuanian Gon, Torah sage, came from Lithuania in the beginning of the 20th century. And he was a student of the Rogachev Agon and Rabbi Simcha Vinsk. He was proficient in the whole Talmud, comes to America. The, America. the United States was a spiritual wilderness. There no Jewish education. At best, you had a Talmud Torah. There was nothing here. He gives examples over there. So ultimately, he was the chief rabbi in Cincinnati. Cincinnati, that's where he was. The last maybe 50 years of his life. Uh, initially, he was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Then he was in another city in, in Massachusetts. But ultimately, the majority of his years as, as a rabbi, he was more than a rabbi. He was, he was the chief rabbi of Cincinnati. So Cincinnati is not that far from Cleveland. So this was in the 20s. And he visited the butcher shops. So in the olden days, the butcher shops, if you remember, on the window would say, Boser kosher in Hebrew letters. Boser in Hebrew means meat, kosher meat. Kosher meat. She so would go in, and usually the one who was the butcher was not an observant man, was not observant. You know, they were traditional but not observant. And to be a butcher, to deliver a kosher product, you have to know quite a bit. 
You have to know how to devein the, the meat. You have to know how to extract the blood for the customer, even though those these people did it themselves. But of course, you have to buy from a kosher source. You can't buy the meat from a non-kosher slaughterhouse and sell it as kosher meat. He goes in and the, the stores in Cleveland had a rabbinic certification. A rabbi oversaw it. And, he's, and they had a letter in the window, Rabbi so-and-so certifies the store as kosher. And it said on the window, basar, basar kosher, kosher meat, okay? So he goes in, every store goes in, he finds out the meat is not kosher meat. They're selling non-kosher meat. Could you imagine? And they have a letter from the rabbi that the meat is kosher. So the people, of course, want to buy kosher meat. So they're buying kosher meat, believing that they're eating kosher. So he goes to the rabbi and he says to the rabbi, how do you give a certification for butcher shops where the meat is not kosher meat? He says, you know something? This is the way I see it. If the shops would only have non-kosher meat, the people are going to buy the meat, not kosher meat. There's a, which level of transgression is worse? Transgressing some deliberately or inadvertently? Let the people believe they're buying kosher. At least when they're eating, eating non-kosher, it's, oh, it, it's inadvertent. But if I wouldn't give the letter, what are they doing? They're going to eat the non-kosher meat deliberately. So I feel I'm doing a service for the Jewish community by giving this letter of certification that it's kosher, although it's not kosher. That's what the rabbi said to him. Could you imagine this level of justification? Firstly, within the context of halacha, it has no basis. No basis. Because anything which is explicit in the Torah, there's no such thing as better violent inadvertently than deliberately. It doesn't, doesn't exist. Secondly, rather than trying to correct the problem, he passed judgment, they can eat not kosher, therefore let them eat not kosher inadvertently. Why don't you try and encourage them in the community to understand the value of kosher or negotiate a price that they could buy kosher meat for less rather than for more. But again, this is all the, the, the distortions which the evil information puts in people's heads to justify many things which are not justifiable. So he gave a tremendous, beautiful marshal, an allegory. A person is told he has, has to travel to a certain place. So he calls up the AAA and he gets what, what they call a triptych. So to give him the triptych, they said, you know, you realize if he, the only road going there, it's, it's, not, it's not a good, the roads are terrible. You probably better take six six spare ties with you because every mile you're gonna have a flat or you're gonna have a blowout. I'm making this up myself. Okay, Larry. Larry knows one of those things. That's why he keeps his car in that garage, doesn't pull it out. Okay. Today they have tires, they 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 self-inflate. This moment it gets punctured, self-inflates. Okay. So the person says, I understand. So the person tells me, I advise you, cancel the trip, don't do it. It's fraught with tremendous danger. Because you may fall into one of these pits. They're going to be sinkholes. You're not going to be able to come out of it. He says, you know, so somebody says to me, I, he says, I have good advice for you. How are you going to deal with the problems? I got a piece of cloth, which is two feet by two feet. And has strings on it. Just put a blindfold on. Just take the road. You won't see the pitfalls. So you have nothing to worry about. So the person says, are you out of your mind? By putting the, the blindfold on my eyes, it's not going to prevent me, even though I may not see the pitfall, but if I fall in, I'm going to fall in. So he says the same thing. If in fact, being ignorant of the law is no excuse for violating the law. I won't, you know, I prefer not to study my obligation. Because if I study it, I may have to do it. So the evil looking says, you know something, better be less learned than more learned. Let, more learned creates problems for you. Be less learned. But if you have the ability to be more learned, it's no excuse that you that you less learn it. And it's considered deliberate. If you could have done the right thing and you chose to take a certain initiative not to do the right thing, although when you're doing it, it's not because you're deliberately doing it, it's classified as a deliberate violation. So the same thing. If you have the ability to be able to study, and today on the internet, there's nothing you can't download. You can download the work of the Chavetz Chaim, loving kindness in every language. Spanish, French, English, Russian, whatever you want. Whatever we're studying here is in every language. No excuse. One time there were excuses. These works were not available. 
How is a person supposed to know? So, but you realize the evil looking nation always, always has a way to be convincing. It's better not to get involved, which is the other approaches the Chavetz Chaim has to dismiss all the large seeming overwhelmingly convincing logic of the of the evil inclination that you should turn a deaf ear to him. One of them, which is very often, person comes to you alone and you're not a rich man. You say, I'm not a rich man. You got so many people that you know are rich, wealthy people. What are you coming to me? And you know, I, I may need it, I may not need it. The other people, they have so much spare cash. The amount you're asking for, for the, to them means nothing. What do you got in them? And this is enough of a reason to push the person off. You know, he doesn't say that. But he says, you know, I really can't do it. I wish I could, but I can't. But in his mind, what's going on in his mind is some of the other, other people could assume this easily. And me, it's going to be a burden. You know something? I'm not doing it for that reason. And it, it makes sense. And you go, you, you consult with a buddy of yours, one of your buddies, you know, from the kiddish club. And he tells you, you know something? It makes good sense. Let him go to someone else. Even though, so the Chavetz Chaim says, a person has a deal. Phenomenal deal has a tremendous return on investment. And he brings it to you. He say, why don't you go to the, rich, the richer person? Let him make the profit. If a person understands the value of doing the mitzvah, it's not only you doing the man a favor. You doing the mitzvah, you're a greater beneficiary than the person who's borrowing from you. Because God gave you the ability to do the mitzvah to be a beneficiary of do that action. The other person is facilitating the setting for you to be able to do the mitzvah. So if you see things in through, through that kind of lens, there's no such thing as, why don't you go to someone else? But again, he says, we're not talking about the person is lending where he's being irresponsible. You're going to demand collateral, the man is good for the money. He's going to get a guarantor, all that. But even so, normally you say, but why, why are you coming to me? Go to someone else. Why don't you go to your family? It's not justified. Just because the family can and they don't, you have an obligation to help the man. That's v'avdul rechel kamocha. You must help your brother as you would want to be helped yourself. If you'd be in that predicament, you must help him. You know, I heard a, a video last night from Rabbi Grossman. Rabbi Grossman has a community up north it's called Migdalor. There's a book that was put out. It's worthwhile to buy it for Art Scroll. It's a phenomenal book, Rabbi Grossman. He's been in many communities. Years ago in the 70s, 60s, he was known as the disco rabbi. He was a rabbi. He was a person that came from Mesha or him, Hasidic Jew. His father was the leading Torah sages in Israel. And he started to do outreach. And he would go into the discos. Could you imagine? Dressed in Hasidic garb. And he would go and he would sit down at the table. And he would engage in conversations with young boys and girls. And through the years, he was successful beyond anybody's imagination. And eventually, he built a community up north literally impacted thousands and thousands of people, brought them to Judaism, institutions, not, not to believe what he did. So he has a pod. He, has, he had a video last night. I read it about now. And he said something very interesting. If you read what was going on in Israel through Yom Kippur, how the level of fractionalization in Israel, being the, the secular and the, and the religious, and I'm not talking about the ultra-Orthodox, even people who, who, had, who went to shul on Yom Kippur, which were even what they call datilumi, traditional Jews. These people came in during services. There were 18 incidences in Tel Aviv. They came in with bathing suits. In the middle, could you imagine, a solemn day, they come in dressed with bathing suits in the middle of the services, disrupt the services, and start tearing, the door, tearing up the pages. And putting water on all the people just to disrupt it. It reached a level and they started a fight. They had to call the police. 
They smashed windshields. There were all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff. It was looked like it was going to be like a civil war. What happens? Since the state of Israel was founded, there's never been a fractalization as what took place through Sukkot. They're ready to kill one another. What does God do? In a moment, the tragedy that took place on Shemini Atzeris. They came in, they butchered Jews in, in, the, in the south. Could you imagine? The Hamas immediately, in, in a moment, the level of unification, religious, irreligious, Haredi, Chosid, Svartik, this what meant nothing. Everybody banded together. They didn't see what you looked like. You're a Jew. We're together. And if we're not together, there's no, we don't exist. All of a sudden, when something went off in their brains, help, chesed. It's not to be believed what's going on in Israel. That's what he spoke about. That a Jew himself can't see himself. It's me, it's you, it's us. And since the founding of the state of Israel, there's never been such a unification as now. As Until that moment, there was never such a moment of fractalization until now, there's never been such a level of unification. The atrocities, what took place on the last day of Sukkot, has reflects the Holocaust. It was that level of, of genocide. So in a moment, within that vacuum, Hashem filled in the vacuum. And only God could have done it. It was a painful, and still painful. But, it's under, but it doesn't make a difference. God does what he has to do. Why were these people the victims? Only God knows. We don't have all the answers. We have to look just facts. Facts is there was a division, which is unheard of, which was going to lead to the destruction of the Jewish people, literally. And in a moment, God gave the solution. There was this tragedy, brought us together. And now we're fighting for our existence. Together. It's not to be believed. You know, people speak, people, till recently, they would donate money to, to universities. They would now a chair. I know some of the people, some of the people are involved with NYU, Columbia, this, that, Kraft built a shul in Columbia. Somebody else gave a Torah there, endowed a chair in NYU. Oh, the Brandeis, all these schools. Even Jews, schools that had like a certain Jewish connotation, Brandeis. And these became political hotbeds, anti-Israel, Palestinians. And they what? And they were ha allowed them to what? To demonstrate for the Hamas. And put Cooper Union. There was a video. The Jewish students religion, had to lock themselves in the library because they wanted to break the doors down and attack them. Because they were Jews. And these are not only Arabs. These are even Americans. Who are protesting together with these kids. So you know something? So many Jews. There was a thing. This person, Cooperman. Who's given over the years. He wrote, wrote $50 million to Columbia. He's on the board. He's out of there. He's out. He says if the, if the university could tolerate this. And they're not willing to. Criticize it, allow it, you will not see my money again. I resign, my money is going elsewhere. And many people from many universities, whether it's Harvard, whether it's Yale, all these Jews themselves, they said, We're not here any longer. If you could condone and back this and not criticize it, we want nothing to do with you people. That's if that's what you encourage, or not condone it, silence means that we're not doing it. Others want all the Wall Street firms who normally hire people. Any of the protesters who protested with them, they're not hiring them. Because this is, they're registered as a terrorist organization. You have freedom of speech, but not terrorist. And if that's the case, we're not hiring you people. So here you put years into Harvard, into Yale, whatever it is, we're not hiring you. But even these people, we're not talking about religious Jews. 
these philanthropists, they're not religious. They're far from religious, but they, they're proud Jews as Jews. And they believe philanthropy is an expression of being a good Jew. But they say, you know, something, if that's the case. So this also woke them up and alerted them to understand it's not so simple. You give money and everything else, they bite their hand and feed you. No appreciation. Not only that, they want to destroy whatever you represent. If that's the case, what do you do? You retract, you retrench, you redirect, and you reflect on what's going on, what, what's going on in this world. It's again, it's what we call the wake-up call. And maybe a rude awakening for those who were in the dark. Others always knew that it was lurking. It just has to be activated, and it's right there. That I heard from George Rohr. George Rohr, his father was a special man. And he was in business with his father. And they came from Colombia, Bogota, Colombia. That's where he grew up. And his father underwrote Chabad in Colombia and pretty much in South America. He was a very successful man. And after George was married, the first Sunday class we had was at, was at George, George's house. Every Sunday I had a class there. And we would meet. And his father f said, we're going to do, this is when the, the Russia opened its doors and they allowed people to come in when communism actually fell, failed them. And there were tremendous financial opportunities. And George with, went with his father to Russia and they were doing very significant business deals. They made tremendous amounts of money. And as a result of that, every Chabad house throughout Europe or throughout the world was given a certain amount of money to start a Chabad house. And it says on the plaque out the door, sponsored by the Rohr family. Literally, throughout the Soviet Union, or what they call it something else today, or in, in, in India, wherever it is, the Chabad house, because he felt he attributed to his affiliation with them, that was the basis for his success. And he was a committed Chabad person. So when he first came, if you remember, there was a synagogue in Moscow. Even though Russia would not tolerate any religion, but they had a synagogue. It's called the Moscow Synagogue. And that synagogue, the age of the people who went there, they had used to show pictures for their PR that they tolerate religion. They have a synagogue. The average person was that synagogue must have been about 75 and above. No young people were in that synagogue. And in the synagogue, there were informers, that Russian informers. And if they would see anybody, even among the older, people were afraid to speak because these people would inform on them. They'd be arrested by the KGB. And that's it. So people were afraid for their, literally, for their lives. And if a young person would come, a foreign would visit, and he was a little questionable, so people were very afraid they would hand notes, it was pre-planned, it was all clandestine way of doing things. So George spoke Yiddish, speaks Yiddish, and he meets one of these older Russian Jews who was from the right at the time of the Russian Revolution. So he sp still spoke Yiddish. He was raised in the house where they spoke Yiddish. So he says to this Jew, and this is after the fall of communism, it was still whatever it is, but just, it was still the KGB, all that. She says, uh, are there still, and he said in Yiddish, an anti-Semite is called an anti-Semite. Anti-Semite in Yiddish is an anti-Semite. He says, Fernando anti-Semite, are they still anti-Semites? That's what he has, this old Jew was about 80 years old. She so says to George, he says, I want to tell you something, young man. He says, Yedogoy, is not to submit. Every non-Jew is a latent anti-Semite. You just need something to activate him. If the setting is not right, he's activated. He's going to be an anti. He'll be anti-Semitic. This is what this. This is what this old man says to George. Don't fool yourself. You meet a person who'll love you, who'll accommodate you. This that's only because it's going his way. The moment he feels it's not going his way, you never know what, what actually what could, could comes out from under the surface. That's what he said. What's going on in the United States now, the protests, who's protesting with these Arabs? 
genocide, this and that, mutilating the way they kill these people. How do you, well, it's justifiable. How can it be justifiable? They don't even know what they're protesting. They don't. It's it's something, unconscionable things. But that, that's where we're at. But you understand, you have to be a latent anti-Semite even to be able to be able to join with these people. Because if you feel for your fellow Jew, there's no way you say, you know, I have a question. I'll f- figure it out. I'll, I'll do my own investigation. But to join with these people and they talk about Hitler didn't do enough or gas the Jews or whatever is what they're seeing in, in, in London, wherever they have these protests, how do you even identify with these people? Don't you realize if you would have been there, you would have been put in the concentration camp. You'd go also in, into, the, into the gas chamber. But these, these kids don't get it. Doesn't make sense. But, but that's what's going on in this world today. Baruch Hashem in Israel, the level of unification, the amount of money that's being brought there, the, the services, the material, what they're providing, everybody, homes are being opened. Could you imagine a Haredi person, an ultra... Letting a person who's not even fully observant come in his home, and they're being welcomed, and they're visiting these families who are sitting, who are grieving over their dead. It's unheard of. They're opening their eyes. There's so much misinformation on both sides, and because now they realize a lot of the stuff the press was really anti-religious. They wanted to keep the schism between both sides, and they add fuel to the fire always, continuously. But now. The people realize all this information was misinformation until now. Much of it. It was just a very small segment who was literally self-hating Jews. They wanted to eradicate it. To share with you a story. I'm not sure if the numbers are accurate, but there's a question. It was a secular family who had a tragedy, lost a loved one. This past week, and they wrote, and they had of course, a Jewish service at the funeral. And they knew they had to have a minion for the burial because they had to say Kaddish. And they didn't know if they'd have a minion. So they sent out a, a text or an email that there's a certain funeral can take place at a certain hour at a certain cemetery. And they're looking to make sure there's a minion. So there's a question, how many people showed up the fun- at the funeral? Either 2,000 or 10,000 people showed up. Yeah, they're worried they're not going to have a minion. Two or two, and who are the vast majority? Haredim. The so-called ultra-Orthodox. Not the Hasidic, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about oh, people who are dedicated to Torah. They're the ones who came to the funeral. The person couldn't believe it. To feel for the other person that degree, you know what this means. And it became public knowledge. You couldn't have better PR for Achtos for unification and th- th- this event that took place. 